O Son of Spirit, the best beloved of all things in my sight is justice. Turn not away therefrom if thou desirest me, and neglect it not that I may confide in thee. By its aid thou shalt see with thine own eyes and not through the eyes of others, and shalt know of thine own knowledge and not through the knowledge of thy neighbor. Ponder this in thy heart, how behooveth thee to be. Verily, justice is my gift to thee and the sign of my loving kindness. Set it then before in thine eyes. The light of men is justice. Quench it not with the contrary winds of oppression and tyranny. The purpose of justice is the appearance of unity among men. The ocean of design wisdom surgeth within this exalted world, while the books of the world cannot contain its inner significance. Baha'u'llah. Thank you. So now I'll go ahead and introduce our speaker for today. Please remember to keep all your questions until after the talk. Today, we're so excited to have Mrs. Laley Miller Muro with us, and she will be speaking on, is justice or unity the goal from a Baha'i perspective? Laley Miller Muro is the founder and chief executive officer of Tahrir Justice Center, which provides free legal services and engages in advocacy on behalf of immigrant women and girls fleeing human rights abuses. In its 22nd year and with five cities across the United States, Tahira has protected over 27,000 women and girls who courageously refuse to be victims of violence. Laley founded the organization in 1997, following her involvement as a law student in a high profile case that set national precedent and revolutionized asylum law in the US. The case was that of Fauzia Kasinja, a 17 year old girl who had fled Togo in fear of a forced polygamous marriage and a tribal practice known as female genital mutilation. After an uphill legal battle, Fauzia was granted asylum in 1996 by the US Board of Immigration Appeals. This decision opened the doors to gender-based persecution as grounds for asylum. Using her portion of the proceeds from a book she and Fauzia co-authored about the case, Laili established Tahire. Prior to joining Tahire as executive director, Laili was an attorney at the law firm of Arnold and Porter where she practiced international litigation and maintained a substantial pro bono practice. Prior to joining Arnold and Porter, Laley was an attorney advisor at the U.S. Department of Justice Board of Immigration Appeals. Laley was named Newsweek Daily Beast's 150 Most Fearless Women in the World, Goldman Sachs' Top 100 Most Innovative Entrepreneurs, and won the Washington Post Award for Management Excellence. She lives in Virginia with her husband and three young children. And with that, I'll hand it off to Mrs. Miller-Miro. Um, thank you for inviting me and for having this wonderful um, regular opportunity for people to learn about different elements of the Baha'i faith. Um, I'll start off by first explaining um, some very basics about the Baha'i faith and, and it will help understand the specific topic around unity and justice. So the Baha'i faith began in the mid 1800s in what was then known as Persia and is now known as Iran. Baha'is believe fundamentally that Baha'u'llah, who is the prophet founder of the Baha'i faith, is a continuation in a long line of divine teachers that come to humanity. And so Baha'is believe that there's really only one religion, that there's really only one God. We believe that God knows us and knows our limitations, knows our capacity, knows our needs, and sends us throughout our history as a humanity teachers who are relevant, who um, give us teachings, who reinforce spiritual teachings of the past and help apply those spiritual teachings to current and future realities. And so Baha'is will often refer to the world religions as chapters in a book, the same book, or grades in the same school, or whatever it may be. But basically, we believe in this idea of progressive revelation, that learning is progressive, that progress is progressive, and that God's revelation to us, his or her, there is no gender for God in the Baha'i faith, but our uh, language has some limitations around that. But this divine force God helps us along basically and helps us evolve. And so when you look at the teachings in the Baha'i faith, you'll find a lot that sounds super familiar. 
um, love thy neighbor. Uh, lots of teachings, you know, that are in all faiths and are reinforced in all religions, but they're applied differently because we are different, because humanity is different. The people we were thousands of years ago, what we knew about science, what we knew about each other, the level of complexity of how we are organized as a society, the issues that we're tackling are different now than they were thousands of years ago. So when Baha'u'llah came to humanity, um, he said, I am from God. I am another teacher. Um, Baha'is believe, by the way, that prophets or manifestations of God or teachers, divine teachers, come about every thousand to two thousand years. So Baha'u'llah uh, claimed that status and he had revelation. So again, like many religions in the past, our divine prophets, our divine teachers have almost a dual identity. On the one hand, they're just human and they'll refer to themselves in the first person with all their frailties and all their weaknesses. And on the other hand, they're these like perfect mirrors or um, perfect hollow reeds through which God's revelation comes or from which God's revelation is perfectly mirrored or perfectly reflected. And, you know, like a perfect mirror, you could point to the mirror and say, that's just a mirror and you'd be completely right. Or you could point to the mirror, which is reflecting the brilliance of the sun and say, that's the sun. You could point to the mirror pointed to the sun and say, that's the sun. And you'd be absolutely right. It's blinding capacity would be the same. It's ability to transmit heat would be similar very similar properties. So this is the concept in the Baha'i faith of these prophets or divine manifestations of God. And so when Baha'u'llah claim, came, he claimed something extremely significant, in addition to just happening to be another divine teacher, which alone is very, very significant. He proclaimed that this was the day of judgment, that this was the day of justice, that this was the day that had been awaited by religions for thousands and thousands of years, multiple religions all prophesied a day of judgment when things would come to head and would come to fruition and would be followed by a divine springtime, a time of heaven on earth, a time when humanity would become one, a time when we would finally have peace on earth. All religions have prophesied this. And Baha'u'llah brought the claim that the time is now. And so justice is super important because Baha'is believe that this is fundamentally a day of judgment. And then unity is very important because it is the purpose of the Baha'i faith. The Baha'i faith, um, oneness, there's a quotation that said, oneness is the pivot round which all of the teachings of Baha'u'llah revolve. So this idea of oneness and unity as our goal and as our inevitable um, place. This is where humanity is destined to be. It's where we are growing. It's where we are evolving. Has to involve judgment. It has to involve justice. You know, it, and, and we're told that as a humanity, we do have a choice in terms of how we ultimately get to this oneness, how we get to this peace, this unity. We're told that we can get there through unimaginable horrors or through consultative will. We do have a choice. Um, I'm not sure humanity has been choosing very well lately. And it looks like we're taking the path of unimaginable horrors leading to oneness and to unity. But, but this is the journey. This is the path. You know, I think God basically said to humanity in similar ways to what I say to my children, you will grow up. <laughs> you may not like it. You will eventually grow up and you can kind of choose your path. You can choose whether you mature in um, uh, one peaceful way or in maybe a more difficult or tumultuous way, but the growth and the progress is inevitable. So Baha'u'llah said about this day that we're living in, bestir your people, bestir yourselves, O people, in anticipation of the days of divine justice, for the promise hour is now come. Beware lest ye fail to apprehend its import and be counted among the error, among the erring. Okay, so this quote is powerful because we're told to be stir ourselves. You know, and when we stir ourselves, that's not a complacent posture. That's not just hanging around and waiting, right? 
We are supposed to bestir ourselves in anticipation of the days of divine justice for the hour is now come. It's here. It is here. And then we're warned, beware lest ye fail to apprehend its import or be counted among the er erring. So we're, we're warned to not of the dangers of not recognizing the importance of this day. So we know that this is the day of judgment and um, in judgment involves justice. And that is fundamentally what it is about. There's a wonderful quotation in the writings that says the purpose of justice is the appearance of unity among men. Um, what's really super important about that quote is the translation. So in English, the word appearance can mean a couple of different things. It can mean like facade, or it can mean the emergence of something. Um, I don't speak the language that this was originally written in, but I asked a friend who does. And they explained to me that that word appearance in the original language is the same word that's used to describe the rising of the sun at dawn. So what that tells us is that this word appearance in this quotation, it's not a fake unity. It's not a facade. It's not a pretend. It is the emergence, the gradual emergence of unity. So the purpose of justice is the appearance of unity. Now, this is a really hard concept. It seems like a simple quote. <laughs> it's actually a really hard concept because we have a cultural norm that pits these two things against each other. We don't see them as a part of a continuum. Um, we often see our choice as one of unity or one of justice. And um, what we're told in the Baha'i writings, it's not a choice. These two things have to happen at once. You know, and so when someone says to you, let's say you have been harmed, you have been hurt, there has been an injustice, when we're told don't speak of it, don't report it, don't um, pursue justice for the sake of unity. That's a false dichotomy. And it actually harms ultimately even more uh, where we have to end up, which is a true unity that's rooted in justice, that's rooted in the awareness of our faults, that's rooted in complete acknowledgement of our problems our weaknesses, our injustices, so that we can face them and we can deal with them because you can't deal with the problem you cannot see. And the thing about unity is it, it requires, we can't have true unity unless we are working in harmony. We can't work in harmony unless we see each other's perspectives and we cannot see each other's perspectives unless we see the injury, the injustice, the trauma, the oppression, the persecution, small, minor, or large, major, and structural, all of it, we have to be able to receive the discomfort of criticism, of feedback, and of knowing what's wrong, basically, in order so that we can address it. So these are not opposite concepts. They are concepts that lead one to the other. Um, and, and another reason this is really important is because when we have love and we have unity and we have oneness, we can't have fear. And so there's another quotation that I want to share with you from Baha'u'llah, which says that love is a light that never dwelleth in a heart possessed by fear. Love is a light that never, like this isn't even um, maybe, like maybe if you were a better person, it could. <laughs> it never dwelleth in a heart possessed by fear. Um, it's possible, of course, and there are saintly people who walk this earth who are able to not have their hearts possessed by fear when facing injustice. Martin Luther King was this person, you know, he could stare injustice in the face. He could stare at violence quite literally, and he had an amazing capacity to not be possessed by fear. You know, there are people who are able to look at danger, who are able to look at injustice, uh, look at a whole lot of things, and not be in fear. Um, however, most of us mere mortals <laughs> can be very easily possessed by fear. And the best way to get rid of fear is to have justice. It's hard to live in a place of threat, a place of danger, a place of constant oppression, and not have your heart possessed by fear. So if we know that love cannot dwell in a heart possessed by fear, 
and we know that justice, the purpose of justice is the appearance of unity, then we, ha we have this, I think, deeper respect and deeper understanding for the um, synchronicity and the integration of these concepts of justice and unity, which are not opposite to each other. But I do want to acknowledge that justice doesn't feel like unity in the beginning. It doesn't feel like love either. And because particularly if you're on the receiving end of justice, if you're getting the criticism, if you're being told what you did was hurtful, if you're being told what you did was harmful, if you're being told that what you did, even though it might have been the model you had in your family, it might have been what you grew up with, it might be reflective of your culture, it might be accepted normally, and you're being told that that is injustice, that that is sexist, that that is racist, that that is hurtful, and you know, in whatever sense, it hurts to hear that. It's not easy to hear that. So it doesn't feel maybe in the beginning like love and unity and rainbows and unicorns. It's not going to feel that way in the beginning. It's going to feel super hard. Um, for the person who's raising the injustice, it's also going to feel really hard. It takes a tremendous amount of courage to report to the police, to report in the Baha'i community, to a local spiritual assembly, to go to your high school guidance counselor, to talk to your therapist, to talk to somebody in authority, maybe it's HR, maybe it's a police officer, whatever it may be. It, it is very hard to do that. It takes tremendous courage. Also, because we live in a culture where we are more comfortable with backbiting than we are with pursuing justice. And the Baha'i faith makes a distinction. You know, backbiting is kind of venting or talking to somebody, maybe not for the purpose of resolving it, not going to the person who can actually do something about it, but just kind of quote unquote, getting it off your chest, which doesn't resolve it. It never ever does. And but justice, and we, we are told not to backbite by the way. Um, in fact, in the Baha'i writings, it is considered the most grievous of sins. What we're told to do is to pursue justice. And what that means is talking to someone who can do something about it whose job or whose role or um, whose status allows them to do something about it. Maybe it's talking directly to the person that you have a concern with to pursue justice directly with them. Of course, that's always an option. Or if there are reasons why that might not be possible, it may be going you know, to somebody else, but somebody who can do something about it. And, and, and obviously when you then pursue justice, you have to want justice because it doesn't come easy. And, and it can't be dependent on your emotions on one day at one point of time. It has to be with a mindset of pursuing justice, really for the selfless well-being of society and for the spiritual growth of that person. I was talking to um, a friend who was uh, mugged and the mugging was horrendous. It was violent she ended up in the hospital as a result of it. And she was traumatized. She had some PTSD as a result of it and it, it, um, it bothered her very, very much. It turned out this person had mugged a number of people including that same night and um, had harmed a lot of other people. And I called her, it was like two weeks or something after it happened just to check in on her. And I said, you know, how are you doing? And she said, I'm physically recovering. And she said, you know, and also I've really come to forgive this person. Um, which is a laudable thing. And in fact, in the Baha'i writings, we are told to forgive. We're told to love unconditionally and to forgive unconditionally. Um, there is a quotation, in fact, that says, if a person falls into error for a hundred thousand times, he may yet turn his face to you, hopeful that you will forgive his sins. For he must never become hopeless, neither grieved nor despondent. This is the conduct and manner of the people of Baha. A hundred thousand times is a lot. <laughs> That's a lot. I have friends who've, you know, said, I don't know you, she wronged me five times and I'm done. <laughs> and they have like a very low bar, you know, for uh, forgiveness. A um, hundred thousand times. That's what we're told in the Baha'i writings. And so again, in the same way, that unity is not opposite of justice. And in the, in the same way, forgiveness is not opposite of justice. Forgiveness and justice can live in the same heart at the same time, but we have a hard time with that. It's not culturally normative for us to have those two emotions live in the same heart at the same time. 
So this friend of mine who had been mugged, I said, how are you doing? She said, I'm good. I'm recovering physically. I'm recovering emotionally. And part of my healing has involved forgiving this person. Um, and I was like, you know, that's wonderful. And I'm so incredibly happy for you. Um, I said, so how's the prosecution going? How's the criminal prosecution going? And she said, oh yeah, I got a phone call from the prosecutor, but I didn't call them back because I have forgiven him. I was like, no, that's not, <laughs> that's not what that means. And you know, and I think, again, we have a hard time. We really do have a hard time. For many of us, mere mortals, we pursue justice when we're mad. We pursue justice when we're angry. And implicit in that is the justice is about revenge. The justice is about vengeance. So in the Baha'i writings, we're told justice is not about being mad. It's not about vengeance. It's not about being angry. It is about really selflessness. We pursue justice because we don't want that person to harm others. And we want their behavior to be changed. Ultimately, we love everybody. Everyone is created in the image of God. Everyone is dignified and everyone is noble, even people who do horrible things. And we do believe in the transformation and we do believe in the capacity for change. But the way that happens is through justice. When people are corrected, when they are criticized, when they're given feedback, when there are consequences to their action, people can change and they do, but they don't change without the justice. It's very hard to do that. And so it's a gift to that person, justice, and it's for the well-being of society. Um, and so, by the way, she did call the prosecutor back, <laughs> you know, because they, they can't prosecute their case unless they have a witness. And um, it actually really harms legal process if people opt out simply because they don't want to have to think about it or because they have forgiven the person or in their mind they've moved on. Um, so pursuing justice takes a lot of courage. And again, it hurts. It's hard. But it is really important. So another integral concept in the Baha'i faith to understand how forgiveness and justice and unity and oneness all work together is a concept in the Baha'i writings that requires the segregation of roles and responsibilities that have to do with society, community, and the individual. Okay, so I want to share with you a quotation. The Baha'i faith draws a very definite distinction between the duty of an individual to forgive and in fact to rather be killed than to kill. And on the other hand, the duty of society to uphold justice. Okay, two concepts, really hard to live in the same heart, really hard to hold in the same mind. It's complex, but we believe that as an individual we have an unequivocal, unconditional duty to forgive people who have wronged us. And we're told very specifically, and you know, and I know a lot of people struggle with boundaries. And there's there's a lot of a lot of self-help books about that that are not Baha'i inspired, by the way, that don't necessarily reflect Baha'i concepts. Um, there are a lot of therapists that people work with, these kinds of things. And I think we struggle with this balance of how do you have healthy relationships, but we're told very unequivocally in the Baha'i writings that there are three things we cannot do in response to injustice or feeling hurt, feeling harmed, feeling oppressed. There are three things we cannot do. We cannot backbite. We're told that very clearly, kind of no matter what happens to you. We are also told that we cannot hit. <laughs> like That might be obvious, but I tell my nine-year-old son that a lot. It's not obvious, at least in one stage of one's human development. It is something that has to be learned. We do have like animal instincts that some, sometimes require, or uh, looks like a re reflex to fight back. So we can't be violent. We can't backbite and we cannot estrange ourselves. There's a quotation in the Baha'i writings that says, nothing can whatsoever in this day harm the cause of God except estrangement among its loved ones. And so we believe that that actually hurts the faith if there is estrangement. So these are like the three things we cannot do. But within that boundary, uh, within that frame, there, you know, there, one can have boundaries, you know, I mean, what one can say, um, you know, this is a challenge for you, this is a challenge for me, let's navigate each other in the following ways, or let's create these circumstances. Um, you know, there, there was somebody 
um, in my life who had a problem with pedophilia, for example. And there was a justice process in place. There was also a psychological process in place for this person. And they were doing all of this. They, and, and this was all happening. I knew as an individual, it was not my job to further judge that person. There were justice processes in place, right? Um, however, what I said to them was, I love you. You are a noble being. You have challenges and you have hurt people. Um, my job though is not, I'm not your judge. God is your judge and the Justice Department is your judge and that's all happening. And so you are welcome in my home and I, I welcome you and I will never estrange myself, my, myself from you, but you can't leave my living room. So this person knew that there, there was like a boundary. <laughs> you know, I have, I have children and there are children in the community and there were boundaries. This person couldn't do certain things in the community. This person had to stay in the living room. Um, but there's no reason for harboring resentment. There's no reason for harboring a, a estrangement or talking about it or that kind of thing. We can have justice. We can pursue justice. And we can live and have forgiveness, unconditional love. We can do both at the same time. But it's hard. <laughs> and people really struggle. There, there is a lower nature tendency to not want to have to be bothered by the discomfort of the complexity because it's uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable to say to someone, I really dislike parts of you <laughs> and there are parts of you I'm really struggling with, but I am not gonna throw away all of you and there are parts of you that I love and, and we will work through this. That's super hard for people. And I think right now, even culturally, there's a tendency to kind of say, like all or nothing, basically. You have to be perfect or nothing at all. You have to never cause me discomfort, never criticize me, <laughs> never make me uncomfortable, or I'm not allowing you in my orbit um, of positive space <laughs> that people are kind of striving for. But the Baha'i writings challenge us to live with complexity. The Baha'i writings challenge us to pursue justice and to pursue unity at the same time, to have forgiveness in our heart and also to make sure that there are consequences for behavior. And getting this right is critically important because we haven't, we haven't gotten it right as a society. We have erred on the side of forgiveness. That happened, I'm not gonna speak of it. We're gonna put it in the past. We're not gonna look at it. We're not gonna change anything because of it. And what happens is not unity, but the perpetuation of injustice. That's what happens. You might be comfortable now because you don't have to think about it or you've decided you're not going to talk about it, but you have harmed society, basically, by not dealing with it, not pursuing the consequences. Similarly, you may have harmed the person because they didn't have an opportunity to grow. And I'm not saying that they will love that opportunity to grow. They may resist it, you know, when they hear the criticism, when they hear of the pursuit of injustice, it will hurt but in the long term, it is about their own spiritual growth as well and their improvement as a human, which is why we're here on earth. I mean, Baha'is believe that our purpose for living, our purpose for being created, our purpose for having this material experience as souls is to help us grow spiritually. That's the whole reason we're here. And we believe that when we die and when we go to a next life, that life is fundamentally spiritual in character. And to the degree to which we've developed spiritual capacities, that is the degree to which we will be close, near, or far from God. We will be in a state of kind of heaven or hell, depending on choices we made in this life and the development of our spiritual qualities. I, for one, and I, I am blessed to have some friends in my life, some colleagues in my life who help me grow spiritually, who tell me what I'm getting wrong who tell me when I'm doing things I don't even know I'm doing that are actually not helpful, that may be hurting people and who help me grow spiritually because ultimately that's why I'm here and that's what I want to do. Now, does that mean that the very first reaction is one of, oh, thank you so much. I'm so glad <laughs> to receive that criticism. No, I mean, my first reaction might be one of hurt or, oh, dang, I didn't see that. But, but you know, hopefully we can work through that and ultimately see all of those opportunities as opportunities for growth. So pursuing justice, 
pursuing forgiveness at the same time, all so that we can have unity, all so that we can recognize and realize our oneness, and so that we can live in and with unconditional love with each other, which we cannot do if we're possessed by fear. So that's my half hour of speaking on that. And I understand we are going to um, now have questions. And I'm happy to further any of those concepts or discussions. Yes, thank you so much. That was really insightful. And I think really important conversation to distinct, you know, to make the distinction between justice and unity. Um, so now, yes, we'd love to have a Q&A portion. You can put your questions in the chat and um, I'll read them in the order received. Um, so our first question is from Pete. What about a situation where no legal crime has been committed, though possibly a moral outrage has been committed? Because as an NHS doctor pointed out to me, it is not against the law to wind someone up, deliberately making them ill, putting them in a psychiatric ward. And in the aftermath, therefore, there is no one in authority or in any institution, including Baha'i institutions, interested in pursuing justice or even in consulting or discussing the situation. Um, so obviously, I don't know the details of that situation, so I'll refrain from reacting, you know, to, to the details of the situation. But, you know, I think the base question around it, is there something legally wrong versus unjust? It, clearly, our laws are imperfect. <laughs> clearly, um, our laws fail to recognize a, a lot of injustices that should be recognized as injustice. Um, and so I think the answer to your question is it doesn't have to be unlawful to be unjust. And in fact, there are many things that are immoral or that are oppressive or that are harmful that are unjust that may be legal. So I fully agree with that sentiment that pursuing justice should not be about what's legal. Now, but I also want to clarify that when I say pursuing justice, I don't mean through the legal system. Like, um, you can't pursue justice through the legal system unless a law has been broken. So that part's true. So if, you know, kind of what you're thinking is why can't the courts deal with this or why can't a police officer deal with this? You are right in noticing that they have a legal standard that they have to adhere to. Um, however, if you kind of take it out of the legal realm and, and just say, you know, there's been an injustice here, um, that's absolutely true, and that can be dealt with in many other kinds of ways. Um, th this might seem kind of trite, but I loved the example of it. My kids um, in their school um, had an incident. I got a phone call, um, it was, and my, for some reason, my volume was up really high on my telephone, and when I put it to my ear when I was in the middle of a meeting with about seven people sitting around me. The, the words were, hi, this is the principal. I have your children. I have two children in one school. I have three altogether, but two of them were in this elementary school. I have your two children in my office and we have something we need to talk to you about. And I was like, oh my God. And everyone in the meeting heard that and they all quickly scurried out of my office recognizing I had to deal with something. So what the principal described was that there was an incident in the, um, cafeteria where apparently uh, my then seven-year-old had sat on a chair that an older kid who was sitting with my older daughter had previously sat on and had farted on. Okay, so then when my son sat on it and he didn't know anyone had farted on the chair, the whole cafeteria burst in laughter. So he, there was an injustice he felt all of a sudden because he felt he was being laughed at. And uh, he reacted as seven-year-old boys sometimes do, which was with throwing something and a little bit of violence and then tears and running out of the cafeteria. So what this principal did was she had witnesses to describe what was happening. They all gave their version of the story. The witnesses then sat down and talked to him, acknowledged there had been an injustice. Uh, he had been laughed at and that hurt, acknowledged his feelings and that kind of thing, but then also helped him see that there was both inappropriate behavior going on that needed consequences and there was misunderstanding that needed to be forgiven. They had this beautiful justice process and that resulted in um, the, everybody feeling okay about it, everyone feeling resolved, and then a phone call to me <laughs> to explain what had happened. And I thought, this is the kind of thing we need to do more often. you know. So anyway, there's justice with a little J, 
that might mean hearing all perspectives, recognizing what went wrong, recognizing what could do better. And then there's justice with a big J that might in involve jail time or uh, a judicial process. But to be sure our systems are imperfect, our laws are imperfect, and even our capacity for justice in this world is imperfect. The one solace, comforting thing that I will share with you is that the Baha'i writings view justice as not just about this life or your lifetime. Justice is viewed as something that spans the time of this world. And so on, and I, I wouldn't recommend feeling this way because ultimately it's rooted in, in uh, vengeance or kind of like getting back at somebody, but you may find comfort knowing that justice in the next life will be harsher and worse if adequate justice has not been issued in this life. There's a tablet called the Tablet of the Rights of the People. And it's just amazing because the whole tablet, it's a tablet of Baha'u'llah, the whole tablet is about justice, essentially, this um, material and spiritual world concept of justice. And basically there's an analogy in the, the tablet that says that if I steal a seed from you, and I am paraphrasing, it's not like the exact words, Baha'u'llah's words are way more beautiful. But basically, if I steal a seed from you, I have to pay you back the seed, not because you asked for it, because you have forgiven me, right? Like in this model of justice, the minute I steal a seed from you, you're kind of like, I still love you. I wish you hadn't done that, but I'm not holding a grudge. I'll forgive you 100,000 times. However, it's the role of community it is the role of society to implement justice. So who you report my, you know, uh, stealing the seed to must make sure that there is justice. Again, so that I won't steal from others, the protection of society, and so that I can grow spiritually because I am harming myself spiritually through my thievery. Okay, so this tablet goes on. I have to pay you back that seed so because of the rights of the people, not because of vengeance or because you want it back. I have to pay you back because of the I owe the right of the people. It's a justice issue. If I do not, in the next life, I owe you not just that seed, but the tree, its roots, its branches, its leaves, and the fruits of that tree. So in the next life, justice will be exponentially more harsh and it will be multiplied in its severity. There is another quotation, in fact, um, for Baha'is, you may be very interested. There's a book, or, and actually for people who are not Baha'is, by the book, Some Answered Questions. It's uh, Some Answered Questions by Abdul Baha. And there's a whole chapter in that book on the treatment of criminals. It's called The Treatment of Criminals. And, and also it, it explains many things, but it, it explains that in a future, more spiritually advanced time for humanity, we will beg for adequate punishment in this life because we know that if we don't receive adequate justice, the justice we will receive in the next will be that much more harsh. So I think it can give us comfort as well if our current super imperfect, very racist, very sexist, not fully developed legal system doesn't completely work. There is divine justice as well. Thank you. Our next question is from Molly. Um, can you discuss the responsibility of a person adherent of faith to further justice when the oppressor is not able, interested, or capable of justice? Additionally, how can this be in pursuit of unity as well? Said another way, how can the persecuted unite with the persecutor? For example, a group of people who hold violent beliefs, whether sexist, racist, etc. How can the persecuted unite? Um, well, I think justice is an important part of that unity, uh, of, of getting to that unity. Um, you know, I, as, as was mentioned in my introduction, I work with, uh, I work on issues relating to violence against women. And that's a very tangible example because often the persecuted has children with their persecutor. They have to navigate each other. Um, there is a degree of unity that's still needed even after justice happens, and for the sanity and the well-being of the persecuted. She often desires freedom from uh, dwelling, and she desires forgiveness, and she desires his growth. You know, also in domestic violence situations, there was love. 
there always was at some point. And so there's an authentic love in wanting that person to grow. There's a desire to be psychologically free of the anger and the resentment and a desire to forgive. Um, and there's a need for physical protection. And so when one has justice, the temporary protective order, permanent protective order, when you finally have your divorce, when you finally have financial means to support yourself, custody is determined, you know, um, that, that justice can then remove the fear. And then as we know, love cannot dwelleth in a heart possessed by fear. But once that fear is removed, it can allow the person often to then move into that place of forgiveness, move into that place of love, and try then to navigate with boundaries in place without estrangement and without backbiting and you know, all of those things to try to navigate then that newly defined relationship for the sake of their children, for their sake of their well-being, that kind of thing. So, you know, I, I reject the notion that it's impossible to work with your persecutor. It is possible. People have been doing it, people better than I, stronger than I, have been doing it for hundreds and thousands of years. But it's also very clear that justice and having safety is an important part of being able to do that. I think, you know, often, I, obviously, again, I don't know this situation. I don't know whoever has asked that question. But I also think we need to be honest with ourselves. And sometimes people claim there's lack of safety when what they're really meaning is they're uncomfortable or they're feeling triggered or they just don't want to deal with someone. And I think it is important because the bar for forgiveness in the Baha'i faith is very high. And uh, one should not take lightly the, per the perception or uh, the action that might be taken that would distance yourself from somebody. Thank you. Um, next question is from Daniela. How could we contribute to the civil justice system as Baha'is as the teachings have the potential to make our justice system more fair? Yeah, I think that's what I've been trying to do. I think the work of the Tahereh Justice Center and its efforts to help change some laws, change some policies, some systems to make them more fair, particularly for immigrant and refugee women and girls and other survivors um, is a part of that. Baha'is care deeply about social justice issues and Baha'is care deeply, in fact, were uh, commanded to engage in social action and in social discourse so that we can explore actively how we can all work together to improve the policies and systems and ways that we do things and work with each other. Um, you know, tactically speaking, I would encourage Baha'is interested in that field to first understand the field. You know, there are many people who've been leading this work and have been doing this work, particularly people who um, have experienced firsthand marginalization, oppression, and persecution, who we need to be in learning posture around and take leadership cues from in terms of how to engage in the work. So there's, there's, no, um, there's no limit really to how one can engage. I think though it does matter, the spirit of humility, the spirit of learning, and the spirit of service that one uh, enters that area of service in. Um, all of that matters very much. Thank you. Um, our next question is from Frank. Have you begun to approach the process of the equitable distribution of vaccines? Clearly, it's a matter of justice, but also a practical health matter. Should it be a global challenge and taken out of the hands of the rich and powerful? It's a great question. I, so it's an issue I'm not personally working on, so I'm not going to claim any expertise on it. Um, but the, the underlying issue of the inequitable distribution of resources and access to basic human rights like health, um, I would argue justice also. You know, I, I think something that is um, horribly inequitable that needs to be done, dealt with structurally, is the fact that you need a lawyer at all in order to access justice. Um, because justice is a right. <laughs> justice, you should, you should have the ability to live a life with justice. That ability to live a life with justice should not be dependent on whether you can afford a lawyer and a good one at that, um, because there's a wide spectrum of 
whether you can access justice that depends on your ability to pay and your ability to pay well and how good of a lawyer you can get. Or if you win the lottery of legal aid or free legal services, like with the Tahereh Justice Center, you know, we receive, we're able to help only about one out of every 10 uh, survivors who call us because of lack of capacity. And that's like a lottery. It's ridiculous. It should not be that hard and should not be that scarce to receive access to a lawyer and therefore access to justice. Um, so there are so many problems. You know, I, I just, I agree with what you're saying and I would put that in the realm of education too. It shouldn't be dependent on the tax bracket of your zip code um, to receive a good education or have good teachers. It, it shouldn't depend on your ability to pay to access justice and it should not uh, depend on your health insurance, on which hemisphere you live in, what country you live in, or what community, or what state, as it is in the United States, to, um, to dictate whether you can access justice. But the only way that's going to change is if the people who are helping to make those decisions are not only people who have privilege and then have a selfish interest in maintaining the protection of their privilege. Um, and that fundamentally is the problem because people, even well-meaning, even well-meaning people who want to do good are limited in their capacity of perception. You only know what you know. And if you haven't experienced injustice or inequity, it is nearly impossible, as good of a heart as you might have, as, as, as well-intentioned as your efforts might be and as academic as you think you are, it's just impossible to truly understand um, all sides of an issue that would lead, in fact, to the best solution. So we have to change something about our decision making and we have to profoundly change our structures, including vaccination, justice, education, and a whole lot of environment, all kinds of things, um, in order to fix the inequities and the injustices that exist. Thank you. Our next question is from Shahla. Knowing that there is divine justice, should you want to get justice and go after it in this world? And what if one feels an injustice, but others do not see it in the same way? So, I mean, two things I would say about that. It's all, all um, hurt is subjective. And so a justice process, any justice process, like even the one I mentioned with the principal at the school of my kids, or a court process should allow for alternative perspectives. And that may be hard to hear if you're the one harmed because you have your view and you don't want a different view. You know? <laughs> but, but all justice processes in fairness do allow for multiple perspectives. You know, it, it would allow for the person who is the quote unquote perpetrator to say, I didn't realize, or I didn't think that's what happened, or you know, whatever. I mean, they can say whatever they want to say. There can be maybe witnesses who say, I watched that. I saw something real different, actually, than what you're being told. Obviously, the person who's being harmed has to be listened to and has to um, be, be respected. But any justice process does allow, has to allow, for alternative perspective. And, and you know, I think, frankly, that's why a lot of people I've seen who completely opt out of trying to work it out or to you know, pursue justice, do that in the name of my way is the only way, my perspective is the only one. And if you're not gonna just accept it and submissively kind of accept it, then I don't wanna even have this conversation. So I think you know, when you go into a justice process, you actually do have to be open to alternative perspectives and you have to know that that's what's gonna happen going in. It doesn't diminish the harm you feel. It doesn't diminish the offense that has been taken, but it might mean that your version of justice isn't the only one, or it might mean that what people decide, what the court decides, what the principal in the school ultimately decides, uh, what the local spiritual assembly decides, what the counselor decides, whatever it may be, may not be what you had hoped or what you had wanted. So one has to know that of any justice process. Justice isn't defined by only the subjective view of the person who's been affected or and or clearly the, the perpetrator. So that's a thing. In terms of pursuing justice in this life, um, yes, we should pursue justice in this life. Again, for the sake of society, and for the sake of the growth of that person. So if a person is perpetuating a wrong, 
Um, if, and again, I'll, you know, cause I think there's big J justice and little J justice, but, you know, for somebody who goes around um, uh, making racist jokes, okay? That's one version. Or for someone who goes around raping people. Like these are two very different harms, but they are harmful and, and there should be justice. Um, clearly for the rapist, you don't want them raping other people. Pursue justice to protect others, even though it, it has happened to you and you trust it will never happen again to yourself. It's an act of selflessness to society to make sure that that person goes to jail and doesn't harm others. And it will help their soul to receive justice. Um, also, similarly, the person who's telling racist jokes, um, they need to be called out on that. They need to be told that that is unjust, it is unfair, it is hurtful, it creates environments that are hostile to certain people who will be now quiet because you know you're there, <laughs> whatever it may be. And that, but again, that hurts society. It hurts society. Yes, it hurt my feelings, but most importantly, it hurt the community. It hurt maybe the family, it hurt the workplace, whatever it may be. So you gotta stop making those racist jokes. There need to be consequences for that. You've got to receive feedback around that. You know, there's a, there's the justice with a small J that needs to happen there for their own well-being, so that they know too, and they they can become a better person and stop, but also for the well-being of others. So yes, pursue justice. Thank you. The next question is, if a parent has not adequately deterred a child who's now an adult from, for example, deceit in financial matters, should the parent continue to try and help them see their errors to grow out of love for them, or is it out of their hands? And how is this fault of the parent treated in divine justice? Gosh, that's hard because <laughs> I'm a parent too. And I know, I know there will be things, I can see them already, um, that I blame myself for. Um, and I expect God will too. Um, but, you know, we, we, we also try our best, right? So <clears throat> I, I think in terms of, you know, I mean, I don't know. I, I, to be honest, that's, what, that's something I would just recommend talking to a therapist about <laughs> and trying to figure out because there's probably a lot of detail there. But, um, but what can you do as a parent? And, and, you know, and I think with anybody who is um, suffering with anyone who's making bad choices and making repeatedly bad choices. Um, there is only so much we can do by way of criticism. Um, I think though what's important too is to bifurcate the concept of you could improve here from there has been an injustice. Because I wanna be clear, what I'm talking about is injustice. And you know, injustice is where somebody has been harmed. I mean, there's, you know, uh, somebody has been hurt, there has been an oppression, there has been, been an injustice. Um, there are lots of other behaviors where somebody is really only hurting themselves, you know, or um, they're just making dumb decisions that are annoying people, that are hindering their own growth and their own development. Um, but I don't want to frame everything as about injustice, because that wouldn't be fair, that wouldn't be accurate. Um, and so again, I don't, you know, I don't know the circumstances of what you're talking about, but it may also be, uh, and I just, as a person, certainly believe that one can only criticize so much and have that be effective. You know, I think everyone needs to have a receptive ear in order to receive criticism. And sometimes love, in fact, can do more to transform someone's behavior. Um, uh, my parents were very big on positive reinforcement, this like psychological category of positive reinforcement. And it was a little over the top at times, like they would do these things where I knew I had done something wrong, but their response was praising the opposite quality, which I knew I hadn't just exhibited. So, you know, let's say, for example, I was super impatient at dinner time and I like wanted my food and I was being really impatient. My mother would say something like, I love the patience that you're exhibiting right now. <laughs> I'd be like, what? That's, you know, but she had this idea of positive reinforcement that was rooted in changing my behavior based on pointing out the positive or the capacity or the potential for better. You know, some of you may be familiar with positive discipline. There are lots of books on positive discipline. I've read all of them in an effort to try to be a better parent. And there is this psychological thing around people can in fact transform and improve um, maybe more when their good qualities are being pointed out. 
there's also, just to get more psychological on you, there is a well-studied scientific proven method of a four to one ratio, positive to negative. And it's basically the idea that none of us wants to live in la-la land. Like we're not, you know, somebody who just praises us is like, come on, you know, we, we know that's not true. Um, and we don't want to be oppressed with criticism either. But the thing is, there's a balance. And so there was this scientific study done that looked at marriages and looked at HR systems. So it, it had to do, the, the, the empirical data was in marriage and in HR systems. And what they found was that the healthiest marriages had a four to one ratio. Like you could have a fight, you could have a horrible fight. You could have lots of problems, ongoing you know, issues and difficulties. But so long as about you had about four positive interactions for every one negative. Like if you were criticizing your partner, but then you saw their beauty and strength and you, you praised and pointed out the positive like four to one, that was a healthy marriage. Like that was a really healthy, good growth relationship. Um, similar to HR systems, it's been well studied and well documented that workers want to grow, employees want to get negative and criti criticism and hear that. Nobody wants to, you know, live in la la land. But if that's not matched with also the acknowledgement of what you're doing well, your successes and your good qualities, then it, it can just feel horribly oppressive. And again, it's that four to one ratio. So similar with parenting, and I know my husband and I actually, we had one moment with one child who was just, we were like, oh, it was a constant, stop that, don't do that, stop that. You know, and we, we kind of paused and realized like, ooh, our ratio is way off. We have to back this up, you know, <laughs> even if they continue to do things that are wrong, it's not helping them grow to just continue to batter them with what's wrong. So um, anyway, that's not really in the realm of justice, but there, there are different things. Um, yeah. Thank you. Our next question is from Erin. How do we know something is justice and not revenge? It's a great question. I, you know, I think that's in your heart, to be honest. I think it has to do with your intention and your motivation and very hard for anyone else outside of you to judge. Um, only you know that you're pursuing this um, uh, because you genuinely don't want this person to hurt others. And you really want this person to grow and stop what they're doing. It doesn't help themselves. Um, they might be hurting themselves because of it, relationships around them. And you really want them to grow and you really want them to not hurt anybody else. Um, only you knew that, you know that. But I have seen people who through deep conversation, I've come to understand kind of what's their angle basically. And I will tell you that those who come at it from a place of revenge are deeply unhappy, usually. Um, they're unhappy because the process is traumatic when you're in a place of anger and resent resentment. Um, the justice process is traumatic. Also because if you're resentful and vengeful, justice may not make you happy. I, I don't know how, to, how else to say that. Like, your standard for what you want to happen to that person, if you're coming from a place of revenge, may be so ludicrous, frankly, that like no judge would agree to that, no uh, counselor would agree to that, no a sp spiritual assembly would agree to that, because you're coming from a place of like venge revenge and, and uh, uh, um, payback, if you will. And I think people who are in that mindset often want the other person to hurt, basically. And that may not be justice. So only you know, <laughs> but I think it does sometimes become clear who is coming from which place, um, those who are at peace, those who seem to not be in a place of trauma and are able to move on, uh, seem to be coming from a place of selflessness, really, in pursuing justice. They want to protect their children. They want to protect um, others. Um, in, in my instance, it's you know, usually other, other women, um, and they don't want it to happen to anyone else, and so they're pursuing justice. Thank you. Our next question is from Winnie. When members of a Baha'i community are regularly expressing racist attitudes in spite of discussions in the community, a minority member has finally had enough and withdrawn from active partic participation, but still loves the faith and still considers himself a Baha'i. How much is one expected to continue being active in these circumstances? And in this situation, there's no local spiritual assembly. So I think this is, this is one of the unfortunate consequences when there isn't justice. 
And, you know, when there isn't justice, one just feels exhausted and like walks away, <laughs> you know, and that's kind of the really unfortunate result. Um, and, and, it's, and it is important. And, and like I said before, justice takes courage. It takes an incredible amount of fortitude and effort for somebody to step forward. And it takes commitment, recognition, and dedication for people who then are in the community. Um, and by the way, the Baha'i writings, when it, it divides up the responsibility of forgiveness, individual, justice, community. Do not mistake that for institutions. That's not the language in the Baha'i writings. It's community. So it's not that you have to be an assembly member <clears throat> or that you have to be a police officer. It's that you simply have to be nearby. That makes you community and that immediately gives you the responsibility to implement justice. So um, in order to make this point clear, I wanna read to you a quotation from Abdul Baha, and it's in this chapter that I mentioned on um, the treatment of criminals in some answered question. Okay, it's a really long chapter, and this is just a paraphrase of it, but I think it helps makes this point. Um, okay, as forgiveness is one of the attributes of the merciful one, so also justice is one of the attributes of the Lord. The tent of existence is upheld upon the pillar of justice and not forgiveness. So this is how important justice is to society. It makes up the pillar that holds up the tent of existence, not forgiveness. In the same sentence, Abdu'l Baha makes this very clear. The continuance of mankind depends on justice, not forgiveness. So he's like saying really clearly, this is actually more important, <laughs> you know? And so, so we, as a Baha in the Baha'i community, we have to be very clear about this. And then he also talks about the importance of forgiveness. So in this whole chapter, it's like justice, forgiveness, justice, forgiveness. Then there's this one chapter where he, he really, or paragraph where he really pulls it all together. He says, to recapitulate, the constitution of the communities depends upon justice, not forgiveness but communities must protect the rights of man. So if someone assaults, injures, and oppresses and wounds me, I will offer no resistance and I will forgive him. But if a person wishes to assault someone else, it's a very long name, certainly I will prevent him. So if you're coming for me, I forgive you. If you're coming for her, oh no. <laughs> like that's basically what Abdul Baha is saying. If you're coming for her, you have to go through me. Like it's, it's a completely different, and I take on a different identity, basically. So he goes on. He says, um, so if at this moment, he's like, if I'm not making this clear, at, if at this moment, so-and-so were to enter this place with a drawn sword, a drawn sword, right? These are not just harsh words. A drawn sword, wishing to assault, wound, and kill you, most assuredly, I would prevent him. That's like putting yourself in harm's way, physically, right? I would prevent him if he's coming for you with a sword. If I abandon you to him, that would not be justice, but injustice. So, so this is important because we can like look at the dude with the sword and be like, that's injustice. But what we're failing to recognize is our failure to act puts us in his category. We have now become the injustice perpetrator by our inaction. This is really important because we don't have a cultural norm around this. Like people look down, people walk the other way. <laughs> you know, you hear a couple fighting in, in, in the parking lot, you shut your door and pull away as fast as you can. You hear a child being beaten in the grocery store, people switch aisles. It's not our culture, but what Baha'u'llah and what Abdu'l-Baha is saying is we have to flip that on its head and we must intervene, advocate and in, in allyship and in support. Okay, so if this person were to enter John's sword wishing to kill you, I would most assuredly prevent him. If I abandon you to him, that would be, uh, not be justice, but an injustice. But if he injure me personally, I would forgive him. Okay, so it, he's making it real clear. And sometimes when I start to get unclear, I have to reread this paragraph because it's really, really clear. 
So if we are facing racism or injustice, we should speak up and people witnessing should speak up. And the failure to do that, the failure to grapple with it creates fear. And we know a love cannot dwell in a heart possessed by fear. And so if there isn't love, it's going to be real hard to come back. It's going to be real hard to want to like keep putting yourself in that situation where you feel unseen, where you feel offended, where you feel marginalized. And so it's on all of us because it affects all of us and it's for the well-being of society. And we are all community. This obligation for justice, people, I, I find often in the Baha'i community, they'll be like, oh yeah, those institutions, it's their job. That's not what the writings say. It's the word community that's used not the word institutions. Now, institutions have like a higher bar, clearly, for intervention. You're being paid or you were elected to make sure that justice happens. But let's not forget our role as mere bystanders. Um, and by the way, um, on this issue of racism, reading the life of, of Lewis Gregory is powerful on this because Lewis Gregory himself wrote Shoghi Effendi. Uh, he, Louis Gregory is an early Baha'i. He lived in the early 1900s, 1918, in the United States. He was a Black man, the grandparent of slaves, and one of the first lawyers, Black lawyers, in the United States. He was good friends with W.E.B. Du Bois, taught the faith to his wife, who became a Baha'i, W.E.B. Du Bois' wife. Um, an amazing person. And he wrote Shoghi Effendi. Oh, no, no. Okay, initially he wrote Abdu'l Baha. Later he wrote Shoghi Effendi. Actually, this moment was with Abdu'l Baha. And he basically said, like, I don't want to ruffle feathers, but Baha'is are low racist. <laughs> he wrote Abdu'l Baha. And he's like, uh, they're having feasts separate, like white people and black people. And I don't want to. And he was very sweet. This letter is like, I'm a new Baha'i. I don't want to ruffle feathers. And Abdu'l Baha wrote him back and said, it is basically it would be an injustice for you not to ruffle feathers. This is absolutely unacceptable. And, and Abdul Baha in turn wrote like a letter saying, don't be separate, you can't do that. He also by his own example stood up for Louis Gregory on many occasions. And he basically said to Louis Gregory, keep speaking and it will hurt. Keep forgiving and it will hurt. Keep fighting and it will hurt. And he basically said, stay in it, stay in it and your instincts, this is unjust or right. You know, it was an interesting, so you can only imagine the, wor the world that Lewis Gregory was operating in, in 1918. So anyway. Thank you so much. Our next question is from Brendan. How has social media, in particular, the tendency of people getting intimately involved in pursuing justice in high profile disputes affected our generation's ability to carry out justice? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> That's really hard. I don't know. You know, I, um, I don't take the view that like never have discussions on Facebook because that's just our reality. You know, I, I think particularly in quarantine, particularly when you can't have lunch with people and you can't see people. Um, I think, you know, there are public spaces of discourse and we cannot bury our head in the sand and say, I don't like it. And so I'm not going to engage in it. Um, and there are really good ways to do it and really bad ways to do it. And um, I do not claim, and I have made my share of mistakes, <laughs> so I do not claim to be able to tell you the perfect way to do that. Um, but I have seen great examples. I mean, I, you know, I've seen some people respond with great kindness, but also unwavering pursuit of facts and truth and uh, the uh, desire to help one see injustice. Like, again, I don't think we have this dichotomous, like, you can't be kind and pursue, in fact, there's a quotation in particular. Uh, well, I'm not gonna try to find it right now, but we're told we can pursue justice and be kind at the same time. There's a direct Baha'i quotation that says that. And so I think it must be true then, it must be possible. And, and I think, you know, sometimes I've seen people rant and rage on Facebook in ways that I'm not sure is pursuing justice with kindness, but I also am sympathetic to the emotion behind it. You know, I mean, I think there's a lot of hurt and exhaustion and anger and like, you know, you know the hashtag for the Me Too movement times up. I resonated with that. I think we, you know, we've all felt like enough. And so there's this like exacerbated, exhausted rage. 
Um, I also think that, and I'll just speak, you know, absolutely personally as a person of privilege, I can take it. It hurts my feelings. I'm not saying it doesn't hurt my feelings. Um, but I have not faced systemic racism, systemic oppression. Um, and if somebody is real mad at me and they're coming at me on Facebook and it hurts my feelings, um, I should be able to handle that. It's very little compared to what many others have faced, which is much more devastatingly harmful, much more tangibly, structurally, and personally damaging. For me, it's about my feelings, mostly. And so, I mean, there are times when I've had to walk away. I just like, you know, get off Facebook for a week or something like that. Um, but I also think that, you know, we can be resilient. We can forgive 100,000 times. We can kind of take a deep breath, take a little detox, mental break, but come back. I mean, I think the thing again is, you know, this thing about estrangement, the all or nothing dichotomy is what's problematic, I think. It's not, it's not all or nothing, but certainly wisdom is helpful. Thank you. Our next question is from Nabil. Is unity a process or an outcome? How can we work for unity in an unjust society, or is it working simultaneously on unity and justice? Okay, so unity and justice are the same thing. <laughs> so back to the, like, it's like, think of it as a continuum. And, and, and so I think the way you phrased that, I would say, yes, unity is an outcome, but Yes, also unity is a part of the process. So, you know, it would be a horrible justice process, for example, to not care about unity at all, all throughout it. Um, the justice process itself should be respectful. It should be collaborative. It should hear perspectives, multiple perspectives. Um, it should consider many things. And these are also qualities of unity. They're needed for unity. So they're kind of like unifying ways, essentially, that justice can happen. Um, so it's a part, it can be a part of the process, or they're very, you know, horribly polarizing ways that justice can happen. And anyone who's been through the justice process maybe knows what I'm talking about. Um, like, let's say even in a divorce case um, where there has been injustice, there are ways that can happen that are just mind-bogglingly adversarial and horrible and perpetuate injustice and are way more disunifying than the couple ever was, even on their worst day. Like that, that's not a great process. Then there are justice processes in divorce cases um, that do protect, that do have consequences, but do it with love, do it with respect, and people come out the other end of it feeling whole and feeling uh, like they have maintained their dignity and that allow them ultimately to have unity. So it, it, the process matters as well as the outcome. Yeah. Thank you. Our next question is from Shada. I love what you shared about your sons and their conversation at school to advance justice. And as we know, there are many models or steps similar to what you described that communities practice to pursue justice. To what extent do you see policies supporting community justice systems and the training of individuals to practice these community lowercase justice consultations. So I love that you raised this because there is a movement afoot. Uh, it's called restorative justice, the kind of restorative justice practices that are being put into place in schools, um, you know, where you, you don't want to like uh, suspend a kid or dismiss a kid. And in fact, the one harmed doesn't feel any better that that's happened either. And there are these other processes where they can sit down, they can talk to each other, there is an apology, there's a recognition, there's a reconciliation. You know, there are these, there are wonderful justice processes that are realizing that, that, that there is justice which is unifying. And then there's justice which is further damaging and polarizing. You know, we also don't want a justice system that views people as disposable. And so there's also a very healthy critique around our mass incarceration system. Um, you know, a 14 year old child who steals something but then was tried as an adult does not deserve to be in prison for the rest of their life. They are not disposable. They can be transformed, they can be changed. And so again, like the justice system that would have a unifying approach must be changed on multiple, multiple levels. Um, but I, I would recommend, I mean, you can Google restorative justice um, and it, transformative justice is another phrase, transformative justice, restorative justice. If you Google that, 
a ton of organizations will come up, a ton of processes, a ton of articles will come up. And it is an exciting field um, that I think will make the world a better place. So there are lots of models. Thank you. Our next question is from Dondi. What is an effective strategy for overcoming injustice apart from praying and teaching? Confronting injustice. Um, I think, you know, we have to confront it. <laughs> so if there is an injustice, um, prayer is helpful, certainly. It can, it can help one find courage within themselves to report the situation or to confront the person to raise the injustice. Um, but, but, you know, we're also told in the Baha'i writings that prayer without action is incomplete, that we have to act. So uh, we, ha we have to confront injustice. You know, I imagine a community in the future that has a very different cultural norm than we do, that feels maybe a little bit more in your business, frankly, than the culture we have now. Like, like I think, you know, and, and let's just be really honest from a racial perspective, because we all have our own baggage. And, and our culture, I'm, I'm gonna talk about the United States right now. And I know that there are people who are living in other parts of the world, but I think there's some, some similar cultural ideas. So in the United States, our, cultural was, our culture was dominated by British culture initially. Like our legal systems, a lot of our, you know, governance systems, very British, and if not completely British, Northern European, for sure. Okay, so there is for honor, what's called honor-based culture, and for those of you who are anthropologists and sociologists, you will know this, but for honor-based cultures, and what this means is where your reputation matters, your reputation, most important thing, not what I've actually done with my life, not what my product is, not what my outcome, but how I look, like that's what matters most, right? Not my actions, but the perception of my actions. If I am from a culture, they call them honor-based cultures, where kind of how you come off and your reputation is way more important. And you'd actually, you'd prefer to hide the truth. You'd prefer to hide what, you know, really, because your image matters more. That is what American culture was based on. And, and so we have this British, like your honor, your reputation, um, stiff upper lip. I'm not going to show my weakness. I'm not going to let you know that I'm a victim of domestic violence because I am so embarrassed by that because my reputation matters most. And that is very embarrassing to me. And I am going to hide the injustice to save my reputation. That's our culture right now. I imagine a culture in the future with this Baha'i framework as being way different, where we don't care. Like the honor part, the reputation part, the embarrassment part isn't the most important thing. It's the truth of our actions. We're not, we won't be afraid to express our weaknesses. We won't be condemned for expressing. I mean, it's both ways, right? Like I'm embarrassed to show my weakness, but there are others who would also accuse me for showing weakness you're trying to be a victim or, <laughs> you know, you're trying to get pity or whatever, because that culture results in a distaste for weakness and a standard of hiding that will come both directions. I'm going to try to hide it and you're going to want to hide it. You don't want to see it in me either, basically, is what it means. But that doesn't work. It complete that whole paradigm isn't going to work in this culture of justice that is outlined in the Baha'i writings. Just won't work. So we've got to make sure that we are naming injustice when it happens, that we are intervening in justice also when we see it. And, and you know, right now it might mean that somebody is embarrassed. There, there was a, somebody who reached out to me one time who said, I think, I think this person is not doing well. They're coming at feast, which is a gathering in the Baha'i community. They attend feast and they look down. I notice that they have bruises on their arms. I notice that their husband won't let them talk to anyone without standing behind them. She was noticing this. And she called me and she was like, I don't know, I don't wanna, you know, it's their business, it's not my business, it's personal, I don't wanna, you know, she had all those kind of like normal reactions. And I, and I said, no, 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 it's your business. You're a part of community. And if there is an injustice, it's your obligation to raise it. And you know, I suggested to her that she say to this woman I, that she had, she kind of pretended a feminine problem and said, can you go to the bathroom with me? I'd like to get your help and to get her alone. And she did that. And then she said, I just want you to know 
that I am here if you ever need help. I wonder sometimes if you might need help and I just want you to know I'm here. And I coached her to say, because we live in this honor culture and this particular in individual came from a very high culture community and they didn't speak English very well, um, that the first reaction will not be gratitude. Like the first reaction isn't gonna be, oh, thank you for saving me. I'm so grateful that you've intervened and you've helped me. The first reaction is usually, oh no, I don't know what you're noticing because I'm in, you know, she's embarrassed. She comes from an honor and, and I do too, you know, a safe face culture. The first reaction is mortification that you weren't hiding it well enough because you were trying to hide it, you know? And that's usually the first reaction. And I, I encouraged her to not be worried about being rebuffed, to not feel bad about being rejected, to not be offended that her help wasn't immediately accepted and to just, try to develop trust. Um, long story short, she did. Long story short, there was a prosecution. The prosecutor in this case said that in his 12, or in his um, 20 years of being a criminal prosecutor, he had never seen this depravity of sexual violence that was happening to this individual. The person who pulled her into the bathroom intervened at exactly the right time. And she ended up helping her. So do not underestimate and don't just pray, <laughs> like absolutely engage and intervene. And that person will tell you like, oh, no, 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 like truly, truly nothing's wrong. Okay, fine. But you're there and they know you're there to help. Thank you. So I think um, our next question will be our last one, just in the interest of time. Um, Sandra says, why is it so much harder to ask for just treatment for yourself than for others, especially as a woman in a patriarchal society where women's rights are still struggling to be equalized? Absolutely right. You know, it's so true with, um, oh God, I'll, I'll say 90% of our domestic violence victims uh, who come to us seeking justice, their turning point was not themselves. Their turning point was when it happened to their children their children witnessed it, or the, he, he turned in violence against their children, you know, that kind of thing. And so again, it's this idea that like, I can take a lot, uh, but the minute I see you harm somebody else, I'm, you know, now, now I've had enough, now I'm leaving you, that kind of thing. Um, I don't know, I don't know. I, I, I think that we have to get over that. We have to get over ourselves. We have to see ourselves as worthy of the dignity of equity, <laughs> worthy of the treatment of, of justice and worthy of respect. And when that doesn't happen, um, we are worthy of justice and we should pursue it. I also think what helps is the Baha'i framework, because again, the, the old world order framework of pursuing justice is to pursue it for selfish reasons, because you're angry, because you're vengeful, because you want to stick it back, whatever it may be. And so I actually think it makes pursuing justice in a selfless context much easier to have a Baha'i framework around it because then you know, and so you don't feel bad because you know you're pursuing justice, not for some selfish reason. You're pursuing justice because you don't want this to happen to anybody else. You want to protect others and you want that person to grow, to not be a violent person. It doesn't serve them spiritually to be a violent person. But it also happens to be true that you're worthy of dignity <laughs> and you're worthy of safety and you're worthy of peace. Thank you. Well, I want to give a big thank you to Mrs. Miller Miro for joining us. We loved hearing your perspective and experience. And thank you to everyone for all the amazing questions and comments as well. We really enjoyed it. So our speaker next week will be Dr. Rane Fanon Pazir, and his topic will be Would I Have Recognized Jesus? A Baha'i Perspective. And again, these talks are every Saturday at noon Eastern time. So if you'd like to be on our mailing list and you're not already, please fill out the contact form that we'll put in the chat again. We're gonna close with a writing of Baha'u'llah set to music.
retire my head with a crown of justice and my temple with the ornament of equity. Thou verily art the possessor of all gifts and bounties. Thank you, everyone. We'll see you next week.